Roger. Lift off and the clock has started. Yes, sir. Reading you loud and clear. Roger all, Discovery. Discovery, Roger, go from Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the December 4, 2019 edition of Space News. This is Michael Abdilla, and I have Tina Stagg and Angelo de Grazia here with me tonight, and we are all from the Space Association of Australia. So let's go straight to Tina and get the show started. Thanks, Michael, and we'll head straight into some Australian space news. Plans for the Square Kilometre Array are close to finalisation, with construction tipped for early 2021, despite the project facing a severe funding shortfall. The world's largest radio telescope, the Square Kilometre Array, or SKA, is an international project funded by 13 nations. It will consist of thousands of antennas across the world, with central cores of operation in Western Australia and South Africa. By combining signals from the large number of small antennas, SKA is in effect a single giant radio telescope capable of extremely high sensitivity and angular resolution, giving it the ability to determine where a signal originates. SKA will have a total collecting area of about a square kilometre, which will make it 50 times more sensitive than any existing radio telescopes. In Australia, the core site, comprising some 130,000 individual antennas, will be at the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory at Malura Station near Bulardi in Western Australia and operated by the CSIRO. Construction will begin next year. Once the review committee approves the design, the next step will be for member countries to ratify an SKA treaty to create an international legal entity able to collect funds and award contracts. The Netherlands has already ratified, with Australia expected to sign on early next year and other nations soon thereafter. But a report last week revealed the project is facing a serious funding shortfall. The SKA is 250 million euros or 275 million US dollars short of the funding needed to build the full observatory. The international consortium developing the observatory is looking to raise 100 million euros in the next year to avoid cuts to main research projects that could jeopardise the entire project. Observatory officials hope existing countries will contribute more funding while working to sign up new countries to join the project. A new national awards program will recognise Australia's burgeoning space industry. Space Connect has unveiled a new awards program that aims to reflect and recognise Australia's rapidly growing space industry. The Australian Space Awards will be held in Sydney in March and will honour the leading professionals and businesses across all levels of the space industry, from major players, small and mid-sized enterprises, academic institutions and associations, through to high-performing individuals such as space executives, students, scientists, rising stars and innovators. The Black Tie Gala event will showcase the depth of talent in Australia's space industry, while affirming its role in supporting national security and driving innovation, economic growth and workforce development. Turning to International Space Station news, two astronauts made progress in the repair of an instrument on the ISS during a spacewalk recently. Andrew Morgan and Luca Parmitano spent about six and a half hours outside the station continuing work to replace the cooling system on the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer instrument. The astronauts spliced lines in the cooling system during the spacewalk, setting it up for the installation of a new cooling pump during a spacewalk planned for this week. The Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer is a cosmic ray detector that has been on the station since 2011. And to NASA's SLS and Orion programs... An Orion spacecraft has arrived in Ohio for environmental testing. The Orion that will fly the Artemis I mission was flown on a Super Guppy aircraft from Florida to Mansfield, Ohio on Sunday. 
It was transported to NASA's Plum Brook Station, where it will undergo several months of environmental testing before returning to Florida. Artemis 1, scheduled for launch no earlier than late 2020, will be an uncrewed test of the Orion spacecraft and the first flight of the space launch system. Over to Angelo. Thanks, Tina. Let's talk about the NASA Moon Program. NASA will request ideas for a lunar rover to be used by astronauts. In a conference speech last week, Tom Kremens, NASA Associate Administrator for Strategy and Plans, said the agency would soon release a request for information for an unpressurised lunar rover for use by astronauts on Artemis moon landing missions. NASA plans to develop the rover through a public-private partnership and have it ready in time for the first Artemis lunar landing in 2024. Kremen said NASA was also looking beyond 2024 for additional capabilities needed for later lunar landings, including a larger pressurised rover and a habitat. Over to the US Air Force. The Government Accountability Office, GAO, sided with Blue Origin in the company's protest of an Air Force launch competition. The GAO said it sustained the protest the company filed regarding the National Security Space Launch Phase 2 competition, which claimed the terms of the procurement unduly restricted competition were ambiguous or inconsistent with customary commercial practice. GAO sided with the Air Force on other aspects of the protest. The GAO decision is under seal because it contains proprietary company information, but the agency said it was uh, working to make a public version available. The Air Force said it was reviewing the part of the protest sustained by the GAO and expects to resolve this issue definitively and expeditiously. The Air Force also said it would revise the criteria it plans to use to evaluate proposals for launch services. In its request for proposals earlier this year, the Air Force said it would make two awards for the National Security Space Launch Program by picking two independently developed proposals that, when combined, offered the best value to the government. The GAO recommended the removal of the words, when combined. Will Roper, the Air Force's senior acquisition executive, said the words would be removed, so each proposal was judged independently on its own merits. Let's move to some European news. Ministers from the European Space Agency's 22 member states met last week to make funding decisions for the next three years. The ministerial meeting, known as Space 19 Plus, took place in Seville, Spain, and agreed to provide nearly 12.5 billion euros for the next three years, giving the agency nearly all that it requested. The agency sought 12.5 billion euros for three years and 14.5 billion over five years to account for certain mandatory programs like science. ESA ministers agreed to 12.45 billion and 14.39 billion euros respectively. However, some programs fared better than others. ESA requested 600 million euros for space safety programs but received only 432 million. That is enough to fund work on the HERA asteroid mission, but a space weather mission that would have operated at the Earth Sun L5 Lagrange point will focus instead on instrument development over the next three years. By contrast, Earth observation programs received more than requested, with 2.54 billion euros versus a request of 2.39 billion. The funding will allow ESA to move ahead on various initiatives, ranging from continued use of the International Space Station to participation with NASA in a Mars Sample Return initiative to lunar exploration.
This will include 300 million euros to start work on two modules for the NASA-led Lunar Gateway, a refueling and telecommunications module called European System Providing Refueling, Infrastructure and Telecommunications, or ESPRI, and a habitation module to be developed in cooperation with Japan. A large robotic lunar lander for carrying cargo to the lunar surface and potentially as part of a sample return system received 150 million euros. Telecommunications received only 1.51 billion euros compared to a request of 1.74 billion euros. But the budget represented an increase of more than 30% from the previous ministerial and there was flexibility to allocate the funding among various programs as needed. Space transportation programs received 2.24 billion euros over the next three years. That covers upgrades for both the Ariane 6 and Vega C vehicles to be introduced in 2020, as well as support for small launch vehicle development. The program also funds Space Rider, an Italian-led program for reusable spacecraft similar to the Dream Chaser or X-37B. And back to Angelo. Thanks, Mike. SpaceX. After a lull, SpaceX is gearing up for a busy December. The company has performed only one launch since August, but has as many as four Falcon 9 launches scheduled for this month. Those launches include a Dragon cargo mission to the International Space Station, the JCSAT-18, Kacific-1 geostationary communications satellite, and another set of Starlink broadband satellites. The company is also preparing for an in-flight abort test of its Crew Dragon spacecraft this month that would also launch on a Falcon 9. The Dragon cargo mission will send nearly a metric tonne of science payloads to the space station. The Dragon, which was scheduled for launch on December the 4th US time, includes 952 kilograms of science among its total cargo of 2,585 kilograms. The equipment ranges from an upgrade for the station's Cold Atom Lab facility installed last year to another payload of rodents for biomedical research. Also on board will be Budweiser. Not the beer, but instead barley that Anheuser Busch is flying to see how its seeds germinate in space. Back to you, Mike. Thank you, Angelo. And let's turn to some other commercial news with Virgin Galactic. Credit Suisse is bullish about Virgin Galactic. The investment firm gave an outperform rating on Virgin Galactic stock recently, saying the suborbital spaceflight company was attractive since it estimates revenues will be three times its costs once it begins Spaceship 2 commercial flights. Credit Suisse also said Virgin had a monopoly on the space tourism market in the near term, claiming it was at least two years ahead of Blue Origin even though the company has already flown its new Shepard vehicle multiple times and is preparing to soon begin crewed test flights. But the investment community is taking a wait-and-see attitude about Virgin Galactic's public listing and its prospects for other space company initial public offerings. In its first four weeks of trading, shares in Virgin Galactic have fallen by about a third although the company is taking the long view as it prepares to enter commercial operations next year. How it performs as it begins commercial service will play a big factor in whether other space startups pursue public offerings of stock and how they will be treated by the markets. And turning to Sierra Nevada Corporation and its Dream Chaser spacecraft. Sierra Nevada has announced the cargo module for its Dream Chaser spacecraft will be known as Shooting Star. The module attached to the rear of the Dream Chaser vehicle will allow the spacecraft to carry additional cargo to the International Space Station. After departing, 
the module will separate and burn up in the atmosphere to dispose of garbage, hence the shooting star name. The company unveiled the first of those cargo modules last week at the Kennedy Space Center. And finally tonight, a new study found that astronauts who spend extended time in microgravity can suffer blood flow problems. The study, published recently, said that 7 of 11 astronauts who participated in the research on the International Space Station had stagnant or reverse blood flow in their left internal jugular vein, which returns blood from the head. Two astronauts also had clots or partial clots form during their time in space. Such clots could have serious health consequences, doctors warn, but say countermeasures could be developed to alleviate them. And that's all we have time for tonight. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Angelo. And we'll speak to you again next week. Good night.